Good evening. I'm Fred Kemp, President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and I'd like to welcome you to the University of Nebraska at Omaha's third annual Chuck Hagel Forum in Global Leadership. This year, the forum is being held virtually in partnership between the Atlantic Council and the University of Nebraska at Omaha. The Chuck Hagel Forum debuted at the University of Nebraska at Omaha in 2019 with a discussion between Secretary Hagel and then former U.S. Vice President Joe Biden, where he asserted, much in the same vein as his current messaging as president, that the engagement with the rest of the world is vital to the success of the next generation of leaders. Last year's forum featured former U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, currently the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, who spoke to pressing issues on climate change and technological innovation. This year, we are delighted to welcome former U.S. Secretary of Defense and former U.S. Senator from Nebraska, Chuck Hagel, and former U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security and former Governor of Pennsylvania, Tom Ridge, to the Atlantic Council. They will share their insights on the role of U.S. leadership in a changing world in a converse conversation moderated by Dr. Michelle Black, Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Although formal introductions will take place later in the program, it is my pleasure to host Secretary Hagel and Secretary Rich today, in particular due to their engagement and role at the Atlantic Council. Before rejoining the Atlantic Council as a distinguished statesman and member of our International Advisory Board in 2015, Secretary Hagel was, was Atlantic Council Chairman from 2009 to 2013. He received our Distinguished Leadership Award in 2005, and again in 2014 as Secretary of Defense. It was in fact Secretary Hagel who suggested partnering with the University of Nebraska at Omaha to host today's event. In addition to joining the Atlantic Council's Board of Directors in 2016, Secretary Ridge served as a member of the Senior Advisory Board to the Future of the DHS Project here at the Council. He played an instrumental role in advancing some of its key recommendations, including the most significant reform of congressional oversight of the Department of Homeland Security since its, found, since its founding. So thank you, Secretary Hagel. It was such a pleasure to work with you as chair. Thank you, Secretary Ridge. It's a pleasure to have you on the board. We couldn't be happier to have you with us today. Now I'll turn to Jabin Moore, who will set the stage for our event as student body president and student regent at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Oma, at Omaha. Over to you in Nebraska, Jabin. Welcome, my name is Javen Moore, and it is my honor as student body president to welcome you to the third Chuck Hagel Forum in Global Leadership. While this year's event is virtual and different than the past, we are thrilled and honored to welcome you to the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Secretary Chuck Hagel and Secretary Tom Ridge, on behalf of the student body, I thank you for your decades of leadership and public service for your commitment to our country and for sharing your time with the Maverick community. This forum is the second series launched by Secretary Hagel in partnership with UNO. The forum explores critical issues with leaders in search of solutions to today's global challenges and gives our UNO students the opportunity to engage with Secretary Hagel, the global leaders, policymakers, and thinkers. Our program will begin with remarks from University of Nebraska at Omaha Chancellor, Dr. Jeffrey P. Gold. Dr. Gold took on leadership of UNO in May 2017, in addition to his responsibilities while serving as Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center and chairing the Board of Nebraska Medicine. With his deep knowledge and broad experience in higher education and healthcare, Dr. Gold is a tireless advocate for education and expanding student opportunities. Chancellor Gold will now give the official welcome and introduction of Secretary Chuck Hagel. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you also to the students, faculty, staff, and members of the Omaha community for joining us today. I also extend my sincerest thanks to the organizers and supporters who've made this virtual event possible. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a rare recurrence when two former United States secretaries 
gather on the same stage to share their years of experience and wisdom. So I'd like to again thank Secretary Hagel and Secretary Ridge for making this yet another historic installment of the Unique Forum and a proud day for all of us here at UNO. When we talk about the maverick spirit and what it means to be a maverick, somebody who exudes strength, entrepreneurism, resilience, curiosity, a certain degree of restlessness, you will see that those qualities are solidly embedded by UNO's very own Secretary Chuck Hagel. As a Nebraska native, Secretary Hagel graduated from the University of Nebraska at Omaha after serving in the United States Army in Vietnam, where he received not one, but two Purple Hearts for his selfless service, among many other honors. He would go on to serve most notably as a Nebraska United States Senator for two terms and later as the United States Secretary of Defense under President Barack Obama. In addition to his ongoing dedication of time and efforts to support UNO and its mission to serve Omaha and of course the state of Nebraska, he has since entrusted to his alma mater with his archives launched a leadership symposium for Omaha area high school students and drawn a national spotlight to UNO through this forum with multiple previous guests who included former Secretary of State John Kerry and, of course, President Joe Biden. All of us here at UNO are grateful to Secretary Hagel for embodying the maverick spirit and sharing it with the world. I hope and I know that you will enjoy a riveting discussion on the global challenges our nation faces today between Secretary Ridge and Secretary Hagel. And so without further ado, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you Secretary Chuck Hagel. Dr. Gold, thank you. I am uh, grateful for your remarks, your introduction, and your leadership of the University of Nebraska in Omaha. Uh, it's important, it's meaningful, and uh, it adds to what this institution has been about for many, many years. Uh, this is a uh, great day for me, a fun day for me, an important day for me, because I'm going to introduce uh, an old friend, uh, someone I have admired for many, many years. Uh, someone who I don't believe uh, it's a, at all an exaggeration to say a, a preeminent public servant of our time. But before I do, I want to thank, again, Dr. Gold, uh, all of the University of Nebraska at Omaha, uh, particular Dr. Michelle Black, who uh, is going to moderate a discussion and a Q&A with Tom Ridge and me, uh, and also to student body president Moore. Uh, thank you for your introduction and uh, what you mean to the university. And I know your assignment as a regent on the Board of Regents is important as well. Now, let me get to my assignment today. Um, it's rare that uh, in public service you uh, have opportunities to serve in different capacities with someone that you so admire and have had that relationship uh, for many years. Uh, Tom Ridge, as you all know, is the third annual speaker for this Global Lecture Leadership Conference. Uh, I ask Tom Ridge to participate and be the third speaker because of his unique background, uh, his capability and capacity to synthesize uh, big issues, his proven leadership in so many areas. Uh, you know that uh, he was the first secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, after the Congress, and I was there at the time, uh, put together a new department Department of Homeland Security in 2002 as a result of what happened in this country on September 11th, 2001. Uh, he assumed that job uh, having been someone who not only had advised President Bush as President Bush's first 
assistant for Homeland Security, but also uh, with the kind of experience that you would want in somebody to assume that new position. Two-term governor of Pennsylvania, six-term congressman, and maybe most important, a uh, Vietnam veteran, an enlisted, enlisted draftee, staff sergeant, infantry, leader of men in combat. Uh, and when you add all that up, that's a pretty impressive resume. But uh, it's impressive because it has facilitated so much good in this country, uh, his careful, wise, focused leadership. So again, to have an opportunity to bring someone like Tom Ridge in for the third annual lecture after now President Biden and former Secretary Kerry, uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure and a privilege. But one other thing about uh, Tom Ridge as to how I, I met him. Uh, in the late 1980s, I was president and CEO of the World USO, and we were preparing to celebrate our 50th anniversary. Uh, it was a big deal. And we thought about trying to get a coin uh, sanctioned by the Congress, congressional coin. They were pretty difficult to do uh, because nobody was doing it. Uh, I went to this uh, junior congressman from Pennsylvania who was a Vietnam veteran who I did not know. I knew of, I knew he was a Vietnam veteran. And I went to see him and I asked him, would he help us? Well, he did help us. Uh, he was a member of the Post Office and Civil Service Committee of the House of Representatives. Uh, he volunteered to testify with me. The two of us sat and testified before that committee. Uh, that made all the difference, his leadership in getting that done. We got a USO 50th anniversary commemorative coin. Uh, and it resulted in a lot of resources uh, for the USO that we could apply to those USO services around the world. That's how I first met him. And uh, that's what I first saw in Tom Ridge. Character, service, a commitment. Exactly the kind of person you want sitting there with you in front of the Congress to talk about what was important for the future of this country and the institutions that facilitate who we are and do so much good for everybody. Now I'd like to welcome my dear longtime friend, Tom Ridge. I want to reiterate my thanks to uh, my friend Chuck Hagel. It's a pleasure to join him. We walked down many paths uh, since that time. We had a chance to sit before that uh, subcommittee and uh, a good and honored friend. And I'm very grateful for the very kind and generous remarks he made. And I tip my hat to my friend Fred Kemp as well in Atlantic Council. I guess one of the opportunities I have right now is part of this magnificent forum. And I thank the university for uh, extending the invitation on behalf of Chuck and the university to me to participate is to perhaps lay the predicate or foundation for what I'm sure will be a very uh, rigorous uh, discussion. Uh, whether it's riveting or not, that's going to be up to you to determine and Fred to determine. He was very kind to talk to us about, talk about that. But I think uh, I start with the very notion that President Joe Biden has inherited the most challenging and complex international landscape, coupled with the most challenging and complex domestic list of challenges in the history of a modern president. And we're going to focus on these global challenges. But let's remember, as we're focusing on these, when he goes into the Oval Office in the morning, he's still dealing with 500 plus thousand deaths and trying to deal with the greatest public health crisis we've had probably since the Spanish flu in 1918. Uh, he's still uh, dealing with an economy while the market is up. There's a lot of people who are either unemployed or unemployed dealing with that, that reality. And he's dealing with the threat of the newfound threat, the escalation over the past three years, as, as, as we noted uh, on January 6th of uh, domestic terrorism. And that's the foundation for much of his work as our president. But as president of the United States, leader, at least in my mind still is, leader of Western nations and democracies and those who believe in self-government and the same principles that we've been espousing and promoting since our Declaration of, in of Independence and our Constitution. Let's spin the globe real quick and then maybe we get into this uh, conversation. 
you've got a resurgent uh, Russia, a individual in Vladimir Putin who talks in terms of mother Russia and reintegrating all Russian speaking peoples. Remind yourselves in 2014, uh, the invasion into Crimea, we haven't had anybody in Europe try to change boundaries since Hitler did it in 1941. And then after Crimea, he moves into the Eastern provinces. Uh, you have over the past several years, the uh, our administration, and I say this very candidly, has distanced itself, and I may say from time to, I say from time to time, dissed our traditional allies in uh, in NATO, and frankly uh, didn't reach out and embrace our allies uh, globally. So you add that factor. You take a look at uh, China. Oh, I know in the United States, the president is also the commander in chief and the titular head of his party. But, you know, President Xi has all three of those titles as well, but he has much more authoritarian control over all three institutions. And you see this reemergence of China, the ex expansion of its sphere of influence in the South China, East and South China Seas. You see its massive foreign aid globally. You see his personal presence, two trips into Latin America, massive foreign aid into the African nations. And then you put on top of that an unstable Eastern Europe with uh, a, a, a super nationalism around some of these countries that 10, 15 years ago were viewed as emerging democracies and the principles of democracy were expanding. And now all of a sudden the super nationalist approach in their leadership. You still have the ongoing challenges in Iraq and Afghanistan, an unstable uh, Middle East, a leader in North Korea who should never have nuclear weapons. We're revisiting the whole notion of uh, Iran and whether we get back into uh, that uh, agreement that was signed five plus years ago, but the relationship with Iran and its position globally has dramatically changed and frankly built on the, uh, the appellation that President Bush, excuse me, the, uh, the criticism that President Bush gave him when he called them a terrorist state and one of the leading terrorist state, if not the most important terrorist state in the world, being in Lebanon and being in Yemen and supporting uh, uh, Syria and their influence uh, throughout the entire Middle East region. And you say to yourself, Vice President Biden walks into the office every morning. Think about the challenges and the, the burdens responsibility on that man's shoulder and on this administration. So what we do need now is a rethinking about our global leadership position, reconnecting with the traditional allies, rethinking our place in the world with this uh, a much stronger, uh, much stronger China, uh, a, a passionate leader in Russia and all the other important, not peripheral, but almost equally important issues in situations percolating up around uh, the world. Uh, that's the challenge for our administration. Uh, that's the challenge for America in the role of redefining its position in the world and the role it takes as a global leader. It's a pleasure to join my friends at the Atlantic Council, uh, Dr. Black, my dear friend Chuck Hagel in that discussion. Thanks very much. Gentlemen, thank you for taking the time today to sit with me and answer questions from our faculty and students at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. I am Dr. Michelle Black, Assistant Professor of Political Science at UNO, and it is an honor to moderate the Chuck Hagel Forum in Global Leadership here at the Atlantic Council in Washington, DC. The theme for this event, the role of US leadership in a changing world is a very timely topic due to recent events. To prepare for today's discussion, we asked UNO students and faculty for questions in terms of this theme and specific for the both of you. I have collected these requests and categorized them into the following sections. The first one is global leadership and alliances. The second, deterrence and counterterrorism. And finally, misinformation, social media, and cybersecurity. I'll try to get through all these questions, but I, know, I do know our time is limited. I will start with the first category, global leadership <clears throat> and alliances, which is a question for you, Secretary Hagel. So Claire Hartford from UNO asks, 
The rise of global populism, which does not seem to be abating as we continue to see populist leaders all over the world remain strong, like Putin in Russia, Erdogan in Turkey. How do we navigate this global populism in U.S. foreign policy? And will the United States remain somewhat isolated in foreign policy or return to a more familiar leadership role in a multilateral system? Michelle, thank you. And before I answer the question, I want to again thank you for your role here today and for what you mean to the University of Nebraska and Omaha and your background and your service to this country in many ways. Thank you. Uh, I also want to take a moment to thank Fred Kemp and the Atlantic Council, the Atlantic Council team for facilitating this as it's really critical at this time to have this kind of capability to partner with University of Nebraska and Omaha to do this in a virtual way so that we can keep this series going. So to Fred Kemp and the Atlantic Council, I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, and uh, I've always been supportive of the Atlantic Council and everything they do, and they're probably more important today than maybe ever before. Uh, and uh, Fred's leadership and, and all that uh, the Atlantic Council represents, uh, we appreciate. Uh, as to the question, well, first, I think the uh, leadership uh, of the United States of America in the world today is indispensable. Uh, Tom Ridge talked about that in his remarks. And I know uh, President Biden is focused on it. He's talked about it. He's given speeches about it. His first, his first speech that he gave in the first department that uh, he visited uh, in his first couple of weeks as president was the State Department uh, to emphasize diplomacy. Um, this, the first part of your question ties to the second part, which I'm, which I'm addressing, because the credibility of who we are as the United States and our leadership uh, is measured not by just what we say, but uh, are we actually doing that, facilitating that here in our own country? Do we have leaders that, that really lead in a way that's, that's meaningful with our citizenry and educating our citizens as, as to why global leadership is important, why alliances are important, why our allies are essential. We couldn't project power in the world if we didn't have allies. We would, we would not have the bases to put our aircraft and our Navy ships and our men and women in uniform. But that's only part of it. It's, it's everything that we have facilitated and led in since World War II. When we built those coalitions of common interest after World War II, uh, United Nations, Collective Security, NATO, IMF, World Bank, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, now the WTO, dozens of multilateral investment banks and institutions, that was all based on common interests, the common interests of all men and women around the world to make a better world. And so if there is a vacuum to all of that, and I think we've seen a vacuum the last few years, then the world is going to become more dangerous and more volatile and more unpredictable. So I think we have to lead again. It's in our interest as much as it's in any country's interest, certainly in our interest. We have benefited from these alliances and these allies more, really, I think, more than anyone has. And so uh, how, and I'll, I'll end this way, how do we deal with populism? The first part of your question. Well, again, I would say you, you, we can't lead on dealing with populism and dealing with our allies and the leaders of those countries who are dealing with populism in their own country, their own sovereign country, unless we show an example in our country how we deal with extremism and militias uh, that we're, we've, we've seen on the rise in this country, certainly the last couple of months. Uh, that's where you start. Then you start by working with the leaders in the other countries, intelligence, sharing and gathering. The things that Tom Ridge spent an awful lot of years putting together at the Department of Homeland Security, and I'll let him address that. 
it's not one answer to the question. It's, it's all of these answers. It's education, it's exchange programs, institutions like the Atlantic Council, diplomacy, uh, obviously working on the environment together, our health problems here in this country with COVID. It's a, it's a global pandemic, not a United States pandemic, a global pandemic. So that's the way you deal with it. Great. Can I, can I, just a couple of thoughts from my, to my friend's uh, comments. Um, use, it's a, nature abhors a vacuum. That's one of the few things I remember in my school. I didn't get a very good grade in that class, I don't think. But, and when we have withdrawn over the past uh, four years, and basically we have, um, I don't think you can make America, first of all, I don't think we need to make America great again, but I do think in order for America to sustain its ability to influence around the world, as Chuck pointed out, it, is, it has been our interest historically to be engaged, to build alliances, to develop relationships, both uh, start personally, strategic, militarily, economic. And what we've seen, number one, is that vacuum has been filled very aggressively by China. So we need to understand that. We need to understand that at one time we had the largest and strongest economy, we had the largest and strongest military, and we had the longest and strongest set of mutual alliances, multilateral alliances in the history of the world. Well, we don't have the largest army and military. We may yet have the smartest, but we know particularly that the Russians and the Chinese are very aggressive. Uh, we have the largest economy now, but we know our GDP, and given the fact that uh, China is there, who knows, down the road, India, maybe 20 or 30 years. So all these advantages that we had in a post-World War II environment through the first decade of the 21st century, they're changed. And we have to think in terms of how we adjust internally to these realizations that our army is not as large as it used to be. Our, we don't have as many aircraft. We don't have as many ships. But we can never have too many allies. We can never have too many friends, to your point. I mean, how much time did you spend nurturing as SecDef yeah. the relationships, not only with NATO, but the emerging democracies in uh, Eastern Europe? How about our friends in South Korea and Japan and New Zealand? So I think there's a challenge for President Biden and this administration and Republicans and Democrats. You can't go around just flexing your muscles and accept it, expecting the world's going to change because you asked them to. Now, it'll change with leadership, but it is our strongest. It's in our interest to rebuild the alliances and think, and bring an entirely different strategic framework as we work with our allies to address common issues because our relationships based on common values as we deal with a very, very complicated and I think a very aggravated and unstable world. As I said in my opening remarks, I think this president has inherited the most complex set of international challenges of anybody that we've seen in recent history. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The next question I have continues this conversation. And Secretary Hagel, you mentioned um, that President Biden was at a security conference where he mentioned that America is back. Have we compromised our partnerships by withdrawing and re-entering some of the agreements that we have done over the last few years and, and now re-entering them? And do you think our partners actually want us back? Uh, yes, but I, I think it's more complicated than that. Um, they have lost confidence in us. They have lost trust in us. Um, they question and rightfully so, uh, because we have to appreciate and respect that every nation serves its own self-interest. Doesn't mean you don't have other interests, your allies don't, but we certainly do. We have to develop strategies and tactics that, that take care uh, of our interests as well as allies, but that's the way it is. And what what these leaders of these, uh, these countries our allies, our partners um, have seen makes them come to this question about our future. What if in four years after President Biden is out of office, uh, someone is elected who takes America right back to where we've been the last four years? Uh, China. Tom's points about China. Uh, China's power 
and their approach uh, is real. And for example, when we walked away from TPP, one of the first things that President Trump did, pulled us out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, our Pacific Asian partners were stunned by that. And that opened the door for China. China said, well, if America doesn't want to deal with you, uh, we will. And we'll make you richer. We'll, we'll produce more with you and help your people. Uh, now, it's another question whether you trust all that and, and the real purpose behind all that. But, but I was told long ago uh, by uh, a Pacific leader that um, he reminded me, uh, he said, Mr. Secretary, you don't live here. You don't live here in Asia. We live right next to China. You live 5,000 miles away. Yes, you have people in base in Guam and so on. But we have to accommodate reality in what's going on. Uh, Europeans have got the same situation, whether it's the Germans' gas from Russia. Uh, where's all this going? And so I think it is, is shaken our alliance to the core because of trust and confidence in, in us that they've lost. And we haven't seen that since World War II. And we've got to make up that ground. And that's one of Biden's biggest, I know, concerns and questions and challenges. I, I think he will do it. I think our country will be behind him. And I, the last point I'd make on this, getting your country behind you on foreign policy issues, and President Biden's talked about this, whether it's Afghanistan or other issues we'll probably talk about, means you have to have a somewhat educated public. You have to help educate your citizens. It's not the citizens' fault if they don't understand what is it you want to accomplish in Afghanistan or the Middle East or wherever. That's, that's the role of leadership. And part of the problem there, in my opinion, has been we haven't taught history and civics in this country in public schools for a couple of generations. And unfortunately, we've got a country somewhat ignorant about how our government works, the importance of allies, the importance of alliances, the importance of allies. And so it, it all wraps into one of, of the challenge that President Biden and this country has ahead of them. Great. Thank you, sir. Se Secretary Ridge, this question is for you. An undergraduate student <clears throat> asked, could you talk a bit about becoming the first head of a new department and cabinet level position as Secretary of Homeland Security? What are your what were your priorities then as America's first Secretary of Homeland Security? It's a great question. Um, I'm going to go right to the heart of governance issues. One, uh, you should know, uh, the students should know that that was uh, one of the few more recent bold initiatives that got broad bipartisan support uh, to, to uh, Chuck's uh, remarks uh, to, in response to your last question. Uh, partisanship the phrase used to be ended at the water's edge, yeah. turning into a political football, which is not in our best interest, because when we change foreign policy into a political football, we lose. So anyhow, I, but I really appreciated his remarks on that. Uh, I would tell you, forget for a moment, the notion that while we were building the department, we were still in a position where we were trying to identify and respond to potential terrorist attacks. But I think, uh, just from a governance uh, point of view, I think your uh, the students would be interested to know how important it was to assemble a team because we actually took the field with part of the team. We hadn't drafted anybody. So at the same time, when you're getting a daily threat briefing in the White House with President Bush and you're trying to respond to whatever information you have that's relevant and that needs a response, you're building a staff. Uh, you're uh, building a culture within the organization. Remember, there are a lot of criticism for, uh, uh, from my Republican friends, oh, it's a whole brand new bureaucracy. No, we inherited multiple agencies uh, and integrating them around a single mission and then reminding the general public that in addition to responding to 9-11, all these other agencies had other responsibilities pre-existing 9-11, so integrating that. And then just operationally on a day-to-day. -day. I think the biggest challenge we had, and I still feel this way early on, was explaining to those in federal law enforcement, and I say this with enormous respect to uh, federal law enforcement, 
Uh, but you can't secure the belt, the country from inside the beltway. So building the relationship between the federal government, state government, and down to the local government. The FBI might have 35 or 40,000 people. You got 700,000 men and women in blue all over the country. Not that everyone needs to know about a potential for a terrorist attack or some other circumstances. But you have people out there, you mentioned the word trust. Allies trust one another. We have... And we need to trust certain law enforcement officials at the state and local level with the kind of information that they can use to assist the federal law enforcement community to combat foreign terrorism. So that was, a, I think, the, finally the pulling together the personnel, integrating the capabilities, integrating the cyber capabilities, which we're never able to do to my, uh, unfortunately, to my uh, satisfaction, and reminding ourselves the first thing we need to do was make sure we were doing it consistent with the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Constitution mm -hmm. protection goes first. And there's a lot of criticism because of the Patriot Act and everything else, but I wanted to assure, and I've assured everybody when I was there, uh, we, mm -hmm. we want to protect our freedoms first. And uh, you do that by recognizing that your role and responsibilities have been framed by the Constitution. So it was a challenge, and I'm grateful President Bush called me. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Recently, UNO has been awarded a counterterrorism center um, through DHS. So the center director asks you specifically, um, Secretary Ridge, you have seen DHS iterate through multiple leadership changes since you were the secretary. What are you hopeful about this current leadership team at DHS? And what advice would you have in this, to this current team? Well, I've had the privilege of knowing the new secretary, not as a friend, but I've known him before. And what I think it's important for the students and the general public to appreciate and understand that he's been inside this organization and held some critical responsibilities in the previous administration. So it's not as if he goes in trying to learn, been there, done that. So he's got this foundation of knowledge that I think is really important. I think one of the first things he has to do is restore the morale of the department. I mean, I said this publicly, I don't mind saying it again. President Trump, because of his political priorities, turned the department into a political pinata. I mean, he just did. And frankly, uh, there was criticism from the right, criticism from the left. And I think his biggest challenge is to uh, restore the morale, the good people that work there. And then the most immediate challenge uh, will be two immediate challenges. The emphasis on immigration reform should be, will be politically, maybe one of the highest priorities of Congress, but it can't possibly be the highest priority of the department. And so I'm hopeful that he, working with Congress, will talk about it reform in an incremental basis. And I think you'll be able to move that issue along and help build a 21st century immigration policy, not with one landmark piece of legislation, I don't think that's going to happen, but take very specific steps toward a goal and do it over a couple of years. The second challenge I think he has is figuring out a way to the department and taking our capabilities, working with the FBI and others to deal with this emergence of domestic terrorism. Right now, I mean, I think Christopher Ray said it the other day, uh, a lot of people have observed that for the past year or two, okay, keep your eye on foreign terrorist threats. But uh, I think the FBI director said they're looking at 2,000 domestic extremist organizations, mm -hmm. <sighs> tragically personified by the assault on the Capitol, you know, which I have to give you an editorial. I was at Shanksville on 9-11 when Flight 93 went down. Americans on that plane prevented foreign terrorists from reaching the Capitol. Fast forward almost 20 years later, we have Americans breaching the Capitol. Mm -hmm. And so I think clearly the Department <clears throat> of Homeland Security will have a role to be determined un, uh, mm -hmm. in collaboration with other federal agencies, spend as much if not more time doing their part combating domestic terrorism as they have historically with a primary focus on foreign terrorism, in addition to mm -hmm. everything else they do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. This is actually, we're moving to our next subject, which has to do with deterrence and counterterrorism. So unfortunately, we are seeing many violent clashes and domestic extremists, 
extremism being conducted by former military members. Can you perhaps, both of you, give us a few thoughts on why you think this could be the case? Simply put, why are veterans participating in acts of violence towards the institutions they fought for? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll start. Well, I'm going to let you answer that one. Uh, that, so you that perplexes. I mean, I'm happy to join you. That that perplexes me. Chuck and I uh, take an oath to the Constitution of the United States. So anyhow, go ahead, pal. Well, that's a good place to start, right there. Um, and I'll I'll follow up on on that point, and I'm sure Tom's going to have some other points to make. Um, where I start is um, those who serve in the military, you did, um, come from our culture, come from every town in, in the United States, small towns, big towns, everything. So, so the men and women who serve, who put that uniform on and serve this country in all different capacities, but specifically we're talking about the military, uh, come from uh, from the culture of our country. And so that's where you start when you're trying to figure out how, how do you deal with extremism in the military or, or in the police departments. It's just, uh, that's a problem as, as well. How big, how deep, how wide, we don't yet know. I know uh, Lloyd Austin, the new Secretary of Defense, is concerned about it. I know that's an issue that he's made so far since he's been there. He'll He'll continue to have to deal with it uh, and needs to, obviously, with his commanders. But also I mentioned earlier um, our lack of just basic knowledge about our government, about civics, about responsibilities of citizenship. Uh, Tom talked about the Constitution. I mean, we're, we're ignorant. This country's ignorant on the Constitution, on just two houses of the Congress. Uh, what do they do? Uh, nine Supreme Court justices uh, or any other dimension of, of our, our government and our governing institutions, which are critically important. And we've seen those governing institutions in this country essentially be gutted the last four years. And so you've got to understand where this is coming from. Then social media, <clears throat> then these different groups. And then different alienated people for whatever reason, whatever their problem is with society. Well, I didn't get a fair break. Uh, it's so-and-so's fault or it's the institution's fault. I mean, that's been around since man has, has been up on, on two legs walking. Uh, uh, that, that kind of assigning blame for somebody else, I can't get ahead. Uh, that's part of the racial issue in this country, part of the issue regarding immigration. These, these immigrants are taking our jobs. Refugees take our jobs. And then social media helps spread that and through misinformation. So there are a lot of factors that go into it that you've got to understand before you can try to, to confront the issue and try to not solve it, because I don't know if we're ever going to solve it, uh, because we're a large free nation that we're diverse, 330 million Americans, we're going to put more uh, in the country. So as long as you have freedom of expression and rights, Tom talked about when he first went to uh, take over as the first Secretary of Department of Homeland Security, adhering strictly to the Constitution. So, so you, you, you didn't take anybody's rights away from you. And I remember when, you, when, we, uh, when we had the Patriot Act up, and part two of the Patriot Act, right. and I voted against part two. I voted for part one because I thought we were infringing on, on rights. So there's a rights issue here, too. Uh, then, you, then you've got, for the military, you've got to remind people. And it was, it was the reason that my uh, nine former Department of, of uh, Defense uh, secretaries and me wrote that op-ed about two months ago. All 10 of us signed our name to it. It was to remind for two reasons, to remind the men and women in the military what they, what they say and what they commit to when they take an oath of office to this country. That's really primary. And, and also to educate Americans about our Constitution, about the role of the military versus the rest of government. Totally different, totally separate. So I think you've got to work on all of that. You've got to, commanders have to be educated at every level, the in, in, senior enlisted, 
commander, company level, brigade level, combatant command level. Uh, commanders have to be aware of this and have to, to address it. And uh, they have to, to do things that will address it. I think it's all of these things working together because we know that the Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, the Iranians are, are, are in this country, and it's, it's pretty clear, working against us uh, through cyber, through intelligence in, misinformation, uh, working collaboratively with this, these extremist groups. So they're, they're working to continue to, to divide this country, to continue to take veterans and military to turn them against their country because the military is bad or because we're persecuting people. And so, uh, again, I think you've got to come at it with that broad a view. And then, yes, you've got to hone in on, okay, what are we going to do about it? But you've got to understand and assess how did, how did we get here? And then you can deal with it. And we can deal with it. And I think uh, it will be a top priority for Lloyd Austin, has to be, and for every commander who has accountability and commanders have accountability. The military is based on accountability. All institutions are to a certain extent, but the military is all about accountability. Uh, that gets us into the sexual assault issues, which I dealt with uh, a lot, but it's all accountability of a commander. So that would be my general answer to the question. I know Tom's got some thoughts on this too. Well, just uh, briefly, it's uh, probably put an exclamation point after remarks. I, I, there are multiple influences there, and I wish I had deep understanding of the pathology behind the decision for someone who's worn the uniform of the country to respond to a dog whistle that led to insurrection. I don't get it. When they had worn the uniform, they would have been called and may have been called, I don't know how many were combat veterans or for service overseas, to protect the institution, uh, the Congress. And it, it's a building and there are people that work there, but it's a reflection of a set of norms, a set of values, a set of principles. And they took their oath to protect and defend that. And for them to do a 180, uh, so is it the dog whistle? Uh, is it social media? Is it a sense of victimization uh, that you alluded to in your remarks and to put them all together? And I think, uh, you know, one of these days, maybe if some of those veterans who end up going to jail for what they did, they'll sit down with a group of psychologists so we can figure out what that pathology was and what led you to be a patriot. And they were I, to uh, participating in a uh, uh, an attack on uh, the capital of the United States. So I, I wish I had a better answer, but I think there's many reasons for it, how they interconnected and how they led those individuals to do 180 from the oath they took when they swore uh, to protect uh, this country. I, I just don't know, I wish I did. Well, thank you for your answers. Um, you mentioned a little bit about foreign influence. So I'd like to, to go to that question. And this is for both of you. Liz Bender, uh, undergraduate student, asks, we are seeing our country battle foreign influence with our elections, our domestic processes, and even our institutions. We all know that combating misinformation is complicated because it can impede on freedom of speech or inadvertently influence populations. But how do we battle misinformation from an impartial and democratic point of view? Well, um as far as I'm concerned, it, uh, that question uh, could be incorporated into the previous question to some extent. Uh, and it's some of the same factors that I said, I think, that are, are part of this, that are influencing what's going on. And as I said, the, the, uh, the foreign actors who are using this and who are instigating a lot of it, and very cleverly, um, um, have have really honed honed in on some areas where four years ago, uh, 2016, when we know from all of our intelligence agencies, the Russians played a major role in that campaign. And everybody believed it except one and the most important person <laughs> in the room. But that's just an editorial comment. I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> well, that that's that's true. Uh, but the progress that's been made, especially over the last four years, 
because uh, the leader of our country refused to acknowledge that or accept that, and that affected all the agencies in the government or in, in the executive office where the president of the United States is commander in chief and is president and, and the chief executive officer of the executive branch. That that affected it, and we lost we lost a lot of ground. We lost a lot of time. Now, uh, I mean, how do we? combat this. Well, we've got um, the most sophisticated government, our systems, our knowledge, our technologies in the world. Yes, the Chinese are very good. The Russians are very good. The North Koreans are getting better. The Iranians are good. Uh, uh, but still, we have tremendous capabilities that uh, I'm not sure have been fully implemented and used in in the ways that we need to ad to address this issue as the seriousness of it. I think what happened January 6th, and I think historians are going to be writing about this for a long time, and the consequences that flowed and will flow, and we can't even imagine all the consequences coming out of what happened two months ago, uh, uh, certainly will be a wake-up call to a lot of leaders and institutions as to the the threat, the real threat in this country. I wrote an editorial in an op-ed that I was asked to write uh, on that appeared on January 20th in Defense One News. It's the largest defense uh, publication in the country. And they wanted me to write something that would say, uh, would address, uh, what would be your advice to the incoming Secretary of Defense? And one of the things I said in that was that with all the external problems that we've talked about some of them, and, and Tom took us a tour de force in his comments, before we started the question and answer here, they're real and they're severe and probably as, as challenging as anything certainly we've seen since World War II. But what I said in that op-ed, the internal, the, the internal pr problems that we have and challenges and threats, I, I think are, 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 are just as bad or maybe more serious than external threats. And, um, what that question was all about is certainly one of them, as as was the other question. So uh, I'll end this way because I know Tom wants to address this. We've got to use all of our capabilities. We've got to use all of our institutions. We've got to use all our leadership. The Congress has got to be involved in this. And the American people. The American people have got to understand how serious this is. And it uh, it does include social media. I mean, look at what some of these big platforms did over the last few weeks, they shut off Twitter accounts. I mean, not just to the president, but because the seriousness of the misinformation, disinformation that was out there and these platforms were being used against the interest of our country and the honesty of, of, of our interest. Uh, those kind of things are gonna get a lot more attention. So it's all of these things coming at once that we have to deal with. And that's how we respond to it, using our capabilities. You know, just uh, briefly, I have a couple additional comments. Uh, first of all, I just wish somehow, and maybe we have to start in the early years, uh, to educate the general public, number one, because you see it on the internet, doesn't necessarily mean it's true. I mean, I just, there's, ubiquity of the internet means everybody has access, and you can say whatever they want, and there's very little or no accountability. So number one, I, I really do think we have to be far more thoughtful in taking as credible what's on the news. And frankly, over the past year or two, both in the profit and in the nonprofit world, there has been a combination. I know we work with a group called the Coalition for a Safer Web, nonprofit, another group that uh, called NewsGuard for a Profit. And they take, in some instances, journalists and smart people along with technology, and they'll rate and they'll tell you, well, we believe from open source comparison. That, that's a true statement. Uh, that's an untrue statement. Uh, think about it before you embrace that one. So getting the mechanisms to work in that social media that raise our level of uh, appreciation for what is, what's thrown out there as true, and I think it's very important. I think it's a, that, that's a citizen's responsibility before you respond to that tweet or you respond to that anonymous article, consider the source, consider the credibility, consider others whose opinions you do know who are willing to be identified with that point of view, whether they have credibility with you, number one. 
And so there's a citizen responsibility you have. The government needs to respond to it. We have to figure out how. Free speech. Uh, it's not necessarily yelling fire in a crowded theater when you lie, uh, but you get a series of lies and all of a sudden you get people who, who accept them as reality. And then finally, I think, and Chuck may know about this than I do, but uh, building out our offensive cyber capability to, to send a signal to uh, those who use it and have used it to disrupt our elections and elections in other democracies and sending a, a, shot, a cyber shot across the bow of some of these countries to say, we know who you are, we know what you're doing, you're, uh, you're misusing the internet, the kind of misinformation and lies that unfortunately too many of our citizens are accepting. Uh, we need to show our allies that we have that capability to, uh, to respond. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Whoop. So, so um, if you don't Our mind, answers are too long. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so we we so picked we, up bad habits in the Congress. Yeah. <laughs> so if you don't mind, um, a couple of the students wanted to know what advice you might have for the next generation um, of leaders. And so as we wrap up, would you mind having a, providing a few comments for them? Tom, you, Sir? you, you Yeah, listen, I mean, it's uh, proud to be with my friend. I'm going to let him have the final word. Uh, senators always have the final word over congressmen <laughs> in the House, so that's, that's, the, that's the pecking order. Uh, believe in your country. In spite of all our imperfections, and we got plenty. From the day we signed, uh, that the Constitution was signed, even democracies is, is dysfunctional as it seems now, we continue to try to address those imperfections and those inequalities. That's what we do. Believe in it. And if you think you have a role in that space, and I don't necessarily mean an elective office or working government, uh, but uh, I do think public service in many different forms, not just elected service. There, we need so many different disciplines and smart minds and men and women of capabilities across the board uh, to be involved. And then finally, uh, be involved in the political process. So hold those who represent you at the local, state, and federal level accountable. And lastly, if you believe in your country and you want to make a difference, don't ever, ever miss a primary or a general election. And I don't care what it's for. It's not a privilege. It's responsibility of citizenship. People were celebrating that two-thirds of Americans voted during the last presidential election. That's great. Historic. What are the other one-third that were eligible doing? So that would be my counsel. <clears throat> Believe in America and believe you can make a difference. Uh, well, I would uh, add my uh, my absolutely exclamation point to everything the, the good secretary has just said. Uh, in addition, uh, I would uh, say for our future leaders, uh, understand uh, power without purpose is a, is a losing game and it never ends well. Uh, understand what power is about, but what you want to do with leadership and with power. Uh, you have to have power to get things done, but have a purpose. And the purpose always should be to make a better world. The advice I've given to young people over the years, and Tom's talked to a lot of them, uh, when they ask me, should I run for office? I say, only you can make that decision. You can talk to your spouse, you can talk to your mother and father and your friends, but only you can make that. You gotta go down deep. And I said, there's only one question that matters. And that question is, why do I wanna do it? That, that's the only question. And if the answer is not to make a better world, then don't do it. Then do not do it. Uh, I think those are, for me, guideposts uh, for every emerging leader, every young person who wants to do something important in the world do it, do it for the right reasons. Do it for the right reasons. And that requires respect everybody, respect everybody's opinion. Uh, doesn't mean you have to have Sunday dinner with them or drive across country with them on vacation, but respect them. Everyone has something to say and every human being is valuable. And, and if you don't take that into leadership, you're gonna have problems and it won't, uh, it won't end well for your country and the institution you're leading. Great, thank you. Unfortunately, 
I have a dozen of questions I'd still like to ask, but we're out of time. So thank you both Secretary Hagel and Secretary Ridge for being here, being here with us today and taking the time to address these important and timely to topics. I know that we, the university, looks forward to, the, forward to organizing the Chuck Hagel Forum each year, and I'm honored to be selected to come here with you today. It wouldn't have been possible without the efforts of all our students, faculty, staff, and administrators. I would also like to especially thank Mr. Fred Kemp and the staff at the Atlanta Council for their support. Gentlemen, it has been a pleasure, and to everyone watching, we'll see you next year.